So now that everyone's settled in, I'll uh, go ahead and get started. Um, please, at any time, feel free to get up, grab some food, um, ask questions. So today, uh, what I really want to talk about uh, is community. And then, specifically, I want to talk about what a research community their role is in the larger community. Um, now, specifically, our example is going to be the Illinois Geometry Lab. Okay, um, I'm the outreach manager for the Illinois Geometry Lab. Uh, with us, we have Anton Lukianko, who is a co-founder and former manager. Uh, and Jonathan Manton, our current technical director. Okay, so please, uh, at any point, if you have any questions, there will never be a better time uh, to ask them than right now. Um, uh, so first, all right, our first question: How does the IGL function? Uh, if I want to talk about our role in the community, I really have to explain how the lab works. Um, and really, our key word here is vertical integration. All right. Um, so the basic picture works like this. Uh, we have a professor. This professor has some sort of research question or visualization. There's something that they want to explore. OK? Uh, what they then do is uh, take that idea. They try to break it up into chunks that would be accessible for graduate student. Okay? Uh, these graduate students become our team leaders. Uh, they'll, lead a pair of, they'll lead a team of undergrads. Um, and what they'll do is essentially the same thing the professor did for them, is they'll parcel out the tasks that they've been given, and they'll give them to undergraduates. Okay? So then the undergraduates can work on tasks that are accessible to them. Okay? Um, this is the general, the general model. Okay. Uh, what we also try to do is we have our IGL support staff All right. that at every opportunity either gives training or resources um, or any time that we can. So everyone is basically using their time as efficiently as possible. Okay. This is our, our general idea. So what's the goal? Well, what we really want at the lab, so each member all right, is working on the most difficult or interesting task that's accessible. Ooh, that's a long sentence to write. All right. OK. So again, it's sort of going this model. The professor, well, he has the big idea. He has the big picture. It may not be either. Uh, he may not have the time to be able to crank through all the details. All right. So he generates the long range plan, which he's then able to give to the graduate student. The graduate student might not even understand the question in its sort of highest level form. OK. But then, sort of, the, so the professor, if you think of this as all computers, the professor programs in graduate student. The graduate student programs in undergrad, and then the undergrad writes in C Sharp or Python or Sage to get the project done. Okay? But at every point, everyone is doing the part that's interesting to them, that they're uniquely qualified for, but is also accessible. We don't ask the undergraduates to do the project right from the beginning as soon as it comes out of the professor's head, and we don't ask the professor to sit and do lines of code. Okay? So that's what we're always trying to do. So, and then, so that's our primary goal. And with that, hopefully, each member, all right, moves up the chain. Okay? So the undergrad might have no idea 
what the original project means, but once they work on this task, they give it back to the graduate student, the graduate student gives them a little bit more of the picture. They work on it. The graduate student talks to the professor, because now that part of the project's done, the professor lets them in on a little bit more of what's going on. And eventually, the undergrads will be able to understand as much as the graduate student. The graduate student now sees the picture from the professor, they give the work back to the undergrad, and slowly the undergrads, everyone sort of moves up to a layer they were not at before. Okay? So that's the idea. So our goal is to get each member doing interesting tasks so they can gain understanding that they didn't have before. That's the entire point of our model. Okay? So what's the action we have to take? The main difficulty and a lot of where the support staff comes in and just experience. So we want to make the question slash task accessible to the next layer. That's the real key task. I mean, you can talk about it in specifics in terms of what each member has to do, but at its highest level, what they're really doing is they're trying to make a specific task accessible to the layer below them. That's the idea. All right. Well, this is all well and good, but it's really helpful to know why we would do these things. So our next question, all right, what does the IGL produce? If we're spending all these man hours, you know, our grant money, it's nice to have some outcomes, okay? Well, a big one from the lab comes Original research uh, slash, I'll say, modeling. Yeah, OK. Um, now, this modeling, what it means is either things uh, using our 3D printer or computer visualizations, uh, simulations. If the math has been done before, the picture of it has never been done before. The actual model you can put your hands on has never been made before. We're either creating new knowledge or making something that's not been seen. So a perfect example, Anton, you want to tell a little bit, yeah, and maybe before you pass it around, tell a little bit about what it is or what you use it for. So this is something that um, came out of my research, um, actually a paper that we're about to submit to a journal, uh, studying a three-dimensional three geometry um, that has a uh, slightly different way that it works. So this is um, kind of a building block for that geometry. And uh, maybe I'll pass it around and you can see how they fit together. There are three pieces here, and they should fit together nicely as you play with them. Two of them obviously fit on top of each other, and you can see where the third one goes. And uh, the cool thing about it is that the third piece is actually, um, in this geometry, just a uh, translated version of the other pieces. So it's just moved by rigid motion in that geometry. To us, it looks like it's skewed, but it's just uh, uh, translated by rigid motion. So um, this, this is something that came up in research. And uh, for a while, I was trying to prove that these were actually just normal cubes. And then I uh, drew them on the computer and realized that they're not quite. <laughs> Uh, so the original research and the modeling isn't the only thing that we produce. Uh, we also all right, have a variety of training methods. Okay. So what's our action? Our action is to make people understand material that was previously above them. Right? We want to move them up the chain. Well, as we do that, we now have an entire catalog of how we helped them move up the chain. Okay? So we basically just keep track of what were the questions we had to ask, what were the tutorials we did, what was the material we used to give people that understanding. Um, and so we can then use this as a model to then help other students that weren't part of the original group. So it's nice if we can do this for four kids, but if we do this for four kids and keep track of how we did it, we can do it for as many groups of four as we want to. So this is, this is the idea. We're going to really try to keep track of the teaching methods we used to help our kids move up the chain. Okay. 
Um, and the third thing, well, we use a lot of software and hardware, uh, which is funny because we're giving a whiteboard talk, um, but we do. Uh, and so what we try to do is develop new tools, and by that I mean both hardware and software. Or we try to push the limits of old tools. Okay? That's really what we want to be doing. All right. We want to find out what these things are for. So if there's a teacher that says, I'd like to use this, but I'm not really sure what I can do with it, well, we can say, ah, this is what you can do with it. Um, feel free to explore. Take a guess. Like some people, you know, sometimes people are afraid of some new things because they don't know how it's going to be used. They don't know if it would be applicable to their project. So we can say, dream big, because you can see all the things that we've made with it. You know, um, that's the idea. We're always trying to show uh, what software can be used for, what hardware can be used for. We may not take these activities and teach them and give them directly to a middle school classroom, but a teacher can see how we use a paper cutter for research and then maybe use their paper cutter in their classroom. See how we use a 3D printer to teach our undergraduates, and then they might use a 3D printer to teach their undergraduates. That's the idea. Um, okay. All right. Well, there has to be a reason why people want to be a part of the lab. Uh, I would imagine, right? Uh, so far, I've basically described the benefits for the professors and myself. Um, but we should look at, all right, all right. What do the members get from the IGL? Well, the professors, all right. They get original research. All right. And with that, though, they get their time. Okay. Um, there's been professors associated with the lab. I just had this conversation yesterday. And one of them told me, I've read papers that I would never even dreamed of reading because I was never going to go through all the details. And I'm now looking for papers that would be perfect for a project like this because they now get to just think about it on the level that is worth their time, is interesting to them. And they now have a support structure that they can, you know, they now have a support group, a support structure. Those undergrads can do um, the slog, essentially. And so he's now able to expend more time, explore more research, get more tapped into his field um, because of this uh, vertical integration model that we have. So our professors, they get their original research. All right. So our second group are graduate students. Well, what I'll say is exposure. Okay. Now, what I mean by exposure is it's one thing to be interested in a topic when you sit in a classroom. Okay. But what's in a book is done. It's not what your active research is going to be. It's very different to work in a field when you're working on open questions, which is a uh, the experience you'd have as a professional mathematician. So this is a very good way for our graduate students to, they might think they like a subject, do an IGL project on it, work with a professor in that field, work on an open question, and now they get to see it. It's very, very different than doing homework problems that we've known how to do. Um, it's not the same experience. So they get exposure <coughs> to new material. Um, with that, they get the research experience. They get a taste of what it's like to be a professional mathematician. Okay. Uh, most importantly, since they have to describe the research that the professor has given them to an undergraduate, they get practice with writing and explaining. One of the difficult tasks when you write your first paper that I've noticed is, I'm not really sure what I need to include. What are the details that are essential? What are the details that are unessential? And these graduate students who are working on these IGL projects, they get that experience before they even have to write their first paper. They sort of get practice under, you know, they know what the important details are to help people understand and get the topic that they're talking about. Okay. Um, another big one, right? The whole point is all about community, and so they get networking. They get to meet with professors that they might not uh, have talked to before. Right. There's a lot of graduate students who feel like they pass their comps. They spend two years working on a project, and then they get to talk to professors. And we just sort of speed that up. We let them know that the faculty is actually more accessible than what they might think. Okay. 
Um, not only that, if they're looking at postdocs or things in the future, it's like, well, we might have a former IGL member that's now on staff there, or we might know someone. So their network of people they know at schools they know is bigger than it ever could have been if they had to do this by themselves. But they work with a professor, that professor knows. So the professor's network is now the graduate student's network. And finally, well, maybe not finally, but they get management skills. They have to lead a group of three to five undergrads on a task, which is exactly, you know, if they have to be a teacher and they have TAs, this is the type of thing they'd have to be doing. Okay? So they get their first crack at management skills. And not only that, they're not just leading students, they're leading very talented students, which sometimes has a very different set of challenges to lead. Um, very, very driven, goal-oriented, talented students, and so they get very useful management skills. Okay? Well, now we need to look at our undergraduates, though, because that's the most important. The undergraduate is the backbone of this entire endeavor. Okay? So if they don't get anything out of this, we're really in trouble. Um, all right. So undergrads are big one, right? They get to participate in original research. All right. They have an opportunity to actually participate in something that is going on that's new in a field. Okay. Um, in other fields, the bar to doing research is different than what it is in, say, mathematics. Um, and so this is a nice opportunity for our students to actually get something that would be a very closed door to them in the traditional curriculum. Uh, now they actually get to be a useful, helpful member. Right? They can't just be a lab tech. They can't go into a lab and wash dishes. It's not something that we can do in mathematics. Um, but with the IGL, they actually get ex early, early exposure to, to original research. Um, again, they get the same exposure. Uh, a lot of our undergraduates, when they come to us, they don't even know what mathematics is. They don't know what mathematics graduate school was like. Uh, I didn't even think about going to graduate school until I was a senior. If I had something like the IGL when I was an undergrad, uh, I would have been able to do a lot more in my undergraduate career because I would have known that that was even a possibility. So we like to give, uh, the idea really comes down to informed consent. We always want people to be making choices when they have all the information. If they don't choose to pursue mathematics in graduate school because they didn't know, it, didn't know it exists, it's not really informed. Okay? We want people to always be making decisions with the best information possible. And that's what we like to think that we give our undergrads. Um, and again, networking. Uh, a lot of undergraduates feel uh, that you interact with your professor just only during the classroom, maybe during office hours, never again. Uh, they probably don't even know that graduate students are people that you should talk to. I never spoke to a graduate student once in my entire undergraduate career. But again, what the Illinois Geometry Lab is trying to do is build a broader community. So our undergrads, they not only interact with the graduate students that work on our project, but we have open door policy in, in, in the IGL. All right? We keep our lab open. They, we try to have activities on every Thursday. So they realize that the people in the math department are accessible, are people they should be talking to. It's not just go to class, go home, and be done. There's a broader community that you can learn from and talk to. Okay. Um, well, the last thing that's also nice, too, is they also get class credit. <laughs> uh, all the students in our lab are given three hours of credit. This is actually a class that they're graded on. Okay? All right. Um, so this is a little brief overview of how the IGL functions. Uh, is there any other Questions before I go on to talk about where the outreach comes in, which is the thrust. Yeah? How many of the undergraduates actually end up understanding the research? Oh, yeah. lab you manager. Do? Yeah. <laughs> um, understanding is a very general term. Well, I mean, so that they could talk about what it is that they actually help progress. All of them. They have to. They have to. Yeah. Like, the very end, it's something that we'll actually uh, talk about in a little bit, but we have. Um, a big end of the semester open house where they make the presentation, they 
give presentations to people that come. Um, they have to make posters. Uh, they make a little two-minute video. Um, all of them uh, are able to at least talk intelligently about the research that they did. Uh, beyond just that, they asked me to solve this equation, and I did. Um, they all, they all sort of, right? Yep. So I, I would say with that uh, metric, all of them do. They yeah. may not be able to articulate where it fits within the broader set of research problems. Right. But they can talk about it. That, that sort of gets them up to that next level. I want to leave those two. Well, so in the little uh, abstract that you guys were given, I promised you all outreach. So our next question, all right. Where does outreach come in? Right, I want to talk about the IGL's role in the broader community. What does that mean? Well, so our key words, all right. We have extension. And then horizontal integration. Okay. Whenever you're giving a talk, it's good to have as many buzzwords as humanly possible. These are my two. This is my jargon. Okay. Um, so what do I mean by extension? Well, extension is bringing uh, the community. into our model. Okay? That's the idea. We want the public, we want high schoolers, we want middle schoolers, we want just the general public to be a part of this chain. Okay? We're trying to export the IGL model. That's what I mean by extension. Okay? Um, basically, what we want to do is we want to give the community the same benefits our members receive. Okay? This list of benefits that I just erased. <laughs> all right. That's what we want to be able to share. All right. Um, so it's, it's, it's all about, uh, well, extending that vertical integration model. That's what we want to do. Okay? Um, so let's draw this picture now. I'm going to draw it again because I think it's important. So our professor talks to our graduate student, which talks to our undergraduate student, okay? And then our undergraduates, along with our IGL staff, and then our other IGL members, all right, they all come down and interact with the public. So high school students, middle school students, you know, the public at large. So our IGL outreach team, our other members, we go to the undergrads and we say, how were you able to understand this problem? What was your entry point? Okay. What was the key idea that you were trying to explain with all the work you do? And then we work on trying to make smaller lessons, smaller questions that help get students to understand that entry point, okay? So we really, really try to just distill the process that undergrads have to do. We try to like just get them to understand what the big idea is, which is really nice for them, because then if they don't understand it, uh, if they don't know what the big idea is, uh, it's nice for them to be able to come, go back, talk to the graduate students, talk to the professors, and that also helps reinforce this idea of moving up the chain. Because um, if they can't tell me what <laughs> the fundamental question is that unlocks all of this, then they probably need to think a little bit more about it. Okay? So really what we're doing is we're adding an extra layer onto this chain. Um, and we actually do make high school and medical students uh, pretend like they're in the lab. We split them into groups of four and call them research teams. Like when they, they come in, they work on a problem. Um, you can actually see some of this stuff. Um, there's a couple of 
some worksheets that we've done with kids in the past. Um, if you had those little platonic solids, you can pass those around. Um, you can see some of the activities that we've done. Okay. All right. Um, so specifics with extension. There's two big ways uh, that we get involved, or we try to export this IGL model. First thing, we have lab visits. Okay. Um, we have facilities here. I mean, Anton <coughs> printed out his stuff on our 3D printers. Those platonic solids came out on our paper cutters. We have students who come in and use Mathematica, use Sage, use our computers. We have our lab, and so what we do is we let local high schools and middle schools come and visit our lab. So what happens is about 20 to 25 students, okay, um, they always do some sort of hands-on activity, okay. As you can see, if you pass those around, um, we want them to be able to touch something, right? People are like, oh, I love engineering. It's like math with explosions or physics. I get to turn things. I like gears. It's like, I don't like math because I just have to look at a piece of paper. That's not what we do. Um, all of our undergrads and our staff that is involved in an outreach project, part of the activity has to have something to physically touch. All right, we want people to get a broader sense of what mathematics is. Okay. So we get 20, 25 students, but we also want to take advantage that we're on this campus, that they're at the University of Illinois. Uh, so we let them see the bell tower. That's always fun. Um, we go up while the caroler is playing. All right, they can see the bell tower works. Uh, we'll take them to the math library. There, we just try to give them a broader sense of wh what is the mathematic history. We watch them go through. Uh, we have them go through the math library. We ask them to find as many different languages as they possibly can. We ask them to find the oldest book that they can. And they're blown away uh, that you know, math is this old or still being done. They're like, oh, there's a two the journal from 2012? It's like, yeah, like we're still doing stuff all the time. And, they don't, and the sort of universality of it, um, the fact that you can find, as I think last count when I did it, just on one floor found seven different languages. And I mean, and that was in about 45 seconds worth of work. Um, so it's something that they really, uh, really appreciate. OK. Um, and then what we also do, uh, all right, we have our little, what I like to call, I should say what Randy likes to call, a traveling road show, all right, um, which is essentially the lab visit, but we bring our show on the road, OK? So all the models we make, it still has to have an interactive tactile component. Okay? But now we're able to bring it into the classroom. Uh, we work with teachers. Um, if I always ask them if there's some point in the curriculum which they'd like us to come in. Like, what day are we taking from you? And then we try to do uh, something that really fits. Okay? Um, this is also, it's not just in the class, but uh, after school. So after school groups. So right now we have a project that uh, this is the second semester. It started last semester. It's a four week long session, once a week after school from four to five with about seven to 10 kids. This semester it's about 25 kids and they're there once a week for four weeks. So we can do a real nice like, long term exploratory lesson. Um, it's really nice because we get to work with students who may have had an adversarial relationship with mathematics. But since we see them like once a week for four weeks, we just let them come to it. Like if they don't want to, like, you know, I tell, always tell all the volunteers, if you ask them a question they don't want to answer, let them, let them sit back. This is supposed to be fun and interesting. You know, and you even ask them, what's the part that's interesting to you? And then eventually they'll just sort of get to it. Uh, the nice thing is, no one wants to sit in the same room for one hour. So eventually they find something that's, that's interesting, but we never want to push them. Like, the whole experience uh, is supposed to be exploratory. And it's, it's incredible uh, what you can get seventh graders to understand if you just let them play with it for a little bit. Um, so that's, that's kind of the idea. Okay? All right. So any questions about when I say extension? or about any of the specifics. Right now, we see about 100 kids a semester. Um, that was last semester. Was, we saw about 100 individual students. I mean, not counting seeing the same 10 every week. Um, this semester, it'll probably be another, oh, at least 100. Um, and that's actually activity. That's doing our activities. 
That's not the ones that come to open house. That's not the ones, um, you know, we're setting up a booth at the math contest. That's not the ones that will just come in and sort of sit at a computer for five minutes. This is kids interacting with a long form 50 minute activity. Um, so, okay. So extension, right, um, it's fitting people into our model, all right? The other thing that we try to do, all right, is this idea of horizontal integration. <coughs> which is twofold, really. Well, if in vertical integration we make people part of our vision, right? We have, a, we have a very strong vision of how we think you should teach and interact with mathematics, and we bring people into that. Well, horizontal integration is letting people use the lab for their vision. have a large number of resources. They may have thought of something that we haven't thought of. We give them access to it. We have tutorials every Thursday that are open to the public. Learning Mathematica, Learning Sage. For undergrads, how to apply to an REU. If you're not a part of the IGL, well, you should still be able to learn you know, how to apply to these research opportunities, because it's something that we think is important. Um, we have on how to use uh, LaTeX for typesetting. Um, all of these things that we think are important um, and so we say, well, this is how we use Sage, but maybe you'd like to learn it for something else. Well, you should come into one of our tutorials. You might have an idea. Use our resources to pursue that idea. Okay. Um, and this is actually nice. Uh, we actually did have a seventh grader come in and learn Mathematica for one of our open tutorials. So uh, we actually get um, participation in all these things. The other part of it, though, is for our students, which is get, all right, uh, a bigger picture, I'll say, of their available resources. Okay, the mathematicians that we have, the undergrads that we have, might have a very narrow view of what it is they're doing. They may not know what's available at the University of Illinois. So we try to get them involved in other things. Uh, we have a research group right now that's trying to use the campus cluster for their, for their, for their uh, project. I mean, it's something that if I was just sitting in a class taking Calc 1, I wouldn't even know we had. Um, so, uh, yeah. So we want to basically let students know uh, what else is out there. Um, in this sense, we, I guess here, what do I want to do? I've lost it. All right. If I had a picture, well, so we have our interdepartment that fits in with us letting people share their vision with our lab, right? Um, for the Math 118 class, is that what it is? It's the middle school endorsement? 119. One ni yeah, 119. Okay. Uh, the instructor who has been affiliated with our lab um, thought it would be a fantastic. Uh, activity for their students to use the paper cutter, you know, and they're using it in a completely different way than what we would use it for. But they get to come in, use our resources, use the lab for something. If a professor wants to use the 3D printer to make a model, they can come do that. So instead of us fitting them into how we operate, we help them operate how they want to. Okay, so there's all those interdepartment benefits. Um, and then, right, getting a bigger picture, we have the interdepartment. One of my favorite things about this last semester is that we have a group of two students in the secondary education program that are IGL members. All right, they do activity. They have to do 10 hours of volunteering, um, and so they chose to do their 10 hours, and they spend a lot more than 10 hours being part of our IGL members and our outreach support staff. They help make these lessons. They teach these lessons. They get experiences that they would never get. Um, or, well, I mean, hopefully they would get them before they start teaching, but they get them much earlier in the process. So instead of waiting till observations, instead of waiting until their teaching practicum, they get to make lessons and deliver lessons well before the process would happen in the secondary education program. Okay. Um, right. And then uh, another thing, um, it's not always, students don't always have an, a good sense of like how interesting the things they're 
doing are. They don't know that there's any sort of need or desire to interact with the work they're doing, or they, um, they're not sure where they fit. Uh, so we try to do, um, we try to do these big community things. So we have our open houses. Um, and it's pretty cool for undergrads to have these open houses where they're giving a presentation. They've spent all this time making posters, making a video, uh, and then recruiters from Sandia National Labs who were here to recruit graduate students walk by and then are now there for the next two hours because they're really sort of invested in what our undergraduates have done. They see that there are people who want their skills, um, who are interested in their work. Or like if you go to the farmer's market, so we have our open houses. Um, we had a booth at the farmer's market. And at the farmer's market, there was lines four deep for three straight hours of people interested in what the IGL was doing. Um, and it's not clear to our members at first, when they first start, that anyone cares about what they're doing. No, everyone does. Like, there's something here for you to sell if you are interested. Um, and so it's really nice for them to engage directly with the public at large. What kind of questions do they ask? What kind of questions do they ask? Yeah, when they come in, to, in, the, in, this line, in the lines, I'm, I'm really curious what sort so of things they So a lot of them are very interested in like, the technical aspect. So a lot of them are very interested to see like, not only how the paper cutter works, the 3D printer works. They want to know like, what we use it for. Um, a lot of them are sort of very interested in what we do. Uh, so yeah. So I want to say that uh, one of the fun experiences was that um, we had the 3D printer there at the farmer's market. So uh, a lot of the time people would walk by and we would say, do you want to see the 3D printer? And they'd say, the 3D what? <laughs> yeah. um, and they'd come and they'd look at the 3D printer for a while and then they would say, Oh, so you guys are from the university, you know, are you from the engineering department? And we say, no, no, yeah. math. Mm -hmm. Why would you want a 3D printer in the math department? <laughs> and then we pull out these models and show them what it is that we're doing with our research by means of these models. And people are far more willing to uh, listen to abstract mathematical nonsense, yeah. just like you guys were <laughs> as I was walking around, when there's something hands-off to, pl uh, to play with. And they're already brought in through the 3D printer. Their interest is already deep. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, and that's just one of the exciting things for me is that people, they get to see what mathematics is. They get to see what they do. I always think of my brother who said he would have been a mathematician if computers didn't exist. And I think, no, you should have been a mathematician because we get to play with computers all the time. <laughs> like, you don't have to go into computer science. If you go into computer science, you're doing soul-crushing work with computers. Like, if you actually want to get to play with stuff, <laughs> like, if you, get, if you want to get to play with stuff, if you want to see visualizations, you do as much coding as you want, and then you get an undergrad in CS to finish off all the boring stuff. <laughs> like, if you want to play with computers, the math department's where it's at. Um, you know, and it's just, uh, all of these things, I c there's, there's two big takeaways that I could give. It's a sense of community. We want people to realize that they can talk to professors, they can talk to graduate students, they can talk to each other. There are people who are interested um, and value what it is that they do. Uh, and then we also, like, uh, the second thing, the big takeaway is exposure. Um, it's people are very, very ill-informed about what it is that a math undergrad is like. And math undergrads are very, very ill-informed of what math graduate school is like. And then graduate students are very, very ill-informed of what it's like to be a professor. And all of these things is, you know, we're trying to alleviate. We're trying to let everyone know what the, you know, what the next step is actually going to be like. So. That's it. Thank you very much for your time. Yes. Would you say there's a minimum skill level and high level credit for the undergrad? Okay. Um, so I should uh, go and explain a little bit about some of the details. Uh, now, if you notice, I have undergraduates here and IGL members. What I really should have here is IGL scholars and IGL members. Um, we have uh, our program. Um, is selective in terms of working on the research projects, but our membership list is not. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons why we have all these tutorials and other ways for our members to get involved, because um, we still want them to develop those skills so they can become scholars in the next semester. And this is always our idea, is we want the scholars to sort of be working on um, really interesting, neat projects, so we sort of have to limit the projects and, and um, the interactions with that. But we always want our members to be gaining skills so they could become scholars. Um, there is no minimum level to be a part of the lab, um, but it is a selective process to become 
an actual undergrad working on a research project. Um, so, I can. Practically, it's like third semester calculus. Yeah. So the minimum requirements we list are uh, calculus three to third semester. Uh, in practice, we want them to have a little bit of experience uh, with programming just because a lot of the projects involved there. But we do try to make sure that uh, there are projects available at different levels. We don't want people to wait until their senior year to mm -hmm. uh, get exposure to research level mathematics. Uh, so there's really a because that's one of the things that we're trying to do is you know make this a long lasting community and you can't do that if you're graduating your entire yeah. your entire group every single semester. So what percent of your scholars would you say have actually taken a, a mathematics course with mathematics in the, in the department? Oof. Yeah, I don't think it's a high number. Um, so, and because are any of your scholars Yes. So actually, going back in the inner department, um, our math majors get to work with physics and chemistry majors on these projects. It's not just math undergraduates who are IGL scholars. Um, we have students from all departments, physics department, computer science, uh, engineering. Um, so a lot of them have uh, sort of non-math interests. And it's actually a big thing for us, because a lot of them became engineers or physicists because they didn't know you could get a math degree. <laughs> And, and so, you know, we're now able to get people who are now double majors. They were engineering, now they're engineering and math. They were physicists, and they were going to go to physics graduate school, and they did this, and now they're applying to math graduate schools. Um, and so we, we actually had, we try to pull from a very large, uh, a, a very large array of undergraduates. Because we don't want them, you know, we're not trying to just recruit middle schoolers. Uh, we're also trying to, you know, always trying to recruit um, juniors, seniors. It's never too late to become a mathematician as far as I'm concerned. So one other thing is because, I don't know, two or three weeks ago there was, on um, the Big Bang, mm -hmm. they made 3D models yeah. of themselves. <laughs> so I was in a classroom oh. and I said, they were talking about, did you see the 3D model that they made? And, you know, and I said, well, there is a 3D printer in Alcal Hall. Yeah. And this was two middle schoolers. And I didn't invite them over, but I would have. And I did yeah. oh, So, uh, so far, every manager has had a bust printed of them. Yeah. We actually we have a 3D scanner. Yeah. yeah. We scan it. I told them. I said they said you can't really do that. I said you uh -huh. can do that in yeah. Alka. Yeah. yeah. I have not gotten to the bobblehead <laughs> stage. Yep. So yeah, I think it'd be pretty neat. At the end, we just have like all the former managers just bust of them 3D printed out, just right around the <laughs> the molding on the wall. But you're not going to do that for a middle school class. It, uh, takes, it, takes, it takes a little while. Okay. Um, but there are things, you know. Um, for all the students that come, yeah, they're usually able to see. So even those those four week long things that we do, four or six weeks, uh, you know, the last week they get to come in, they get to see the three D printer, and they get to take something that's been three D printed. Um, so uh, all of them at some point, you know, even if we're doing you know this sort of long term project where they, uh, we we try to let them work with some very fun uh, engineering three D printing type stuff because uh, they. And it's one of the most interesting things that we do. Um, mostly because it's a surprising the number of people are like, what do you need to visualize? What do you, what do you mean a, a picture? Um, right, <laughs> like they think, it's like, I, is there really a necessary, like is it you know, a necessity to have a 3D model of this equation? And it's like, well, that's not what I mean. And instead of trying to argue with them, you just show them. You say, this is what I'm talking about. Like when I mean that the Heisenberg group, like when I mean that as left translation shear, words that might make, not, might not make any sense to anyone, well, when you pass the model around, you get an idea of what, of what that means. Um, so, yeah. Yes? So if we take your arrows literally, mm -hmm. there's only traffic one way. Ah, uh, that's because the diagram is very messy if I put the feedback arrows in. Uh, but yeah, I mean, at every, at every step, right, once a task is is completed, or maybe if a task is deemed too difficult, right? You'd have to. How, ma how often do you meet with your team? How often do they meet without you, and then how often do you meet with your team? So I meet with my team uh, once a week for an hour, and they meet without me uh, for one or two hours usually a week, right. and, and talk to each other, you know, and work individually as well. The faculty member meets um, with the students. As but well. I, I do get something out of interaction with them as well, right? So well, um, socially, or is there something? Geometrically, that you're getting from them. 
I can't Im as a teacher, I can't imagine not learning from my students substance as well as pedagogy. But it could be that you, you get into certain technical knowledges that you can't learn from your graduate So, so there was actually a talk at the math department yesterday about kind of the philosophy of you know what it means to know something. Yeah. The question came up, you know, can you really know something without being able to explain it? And I think trying to explain something that you know is quite essential to understanding it better. So uh, interactions with students and explaining to them what exactly is going on, trying to say make these models and make things more intuitive, uh, build knowledge in that scale. And some of these projects are also, you know, have varying degrees of sort of technical expertise that we don't require our graduate students to be able to do the entire project by themselves. If we have a graduate student who is maybe good at the theoretical but like weak in programming, well then their undergrads are strong programmers and then they actually interact. We have students who are learning Python um, w along with their undergraduates and their undergraduates are quite strong in it. So as they're, as they're teaching them the math, the undergrads are sort of showing them how to code in Python. And so there's this different, since it's such a wide array of expertise in not only the math, but in also the technical aspect, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interchange. Well, so this is actually something that, that's happened, is the professor will have an idea of how the project should go, like how the proof should work. Um, they'd say, you know, try, try, to, try to work on this. Uh, the undergraduates, you know, will work on it, um, but they'll have some questions, and the professor will see that his actually proof idea has no chance of even working. So they do get understanding that they wouldn't have had before. Let's say they pick this paper up, sort of gloss on it, they're like, I know how to do that. I, I actually understand how that, that algorithm is going to work. And now this proof technique is, I'm sure it's going to work. But now they get to have the graduate student work on it with a team of undergrads. They report back and they were like, well, there's actually this subtle detail um, that we can't ever make work out. And the professors, you know, hopefully from that exchange, then they have to rethink about, well, how should my students attack this? They have to, you know, it's in some sense, they get a better understanding when they find what didn't work. And it's for our graduate students' perspective, um, it goes back to a little what Anton says, our graduate students are routinely surprised what kind of questions the undergraduates have. Like you think you might have explained something crystal clear, and the undergraduate is still, is still lost, and you're like, I actually only know how to explain it that one way. <laughs> um, and then you learn something new. Uh, you have to formulate it in a different way that might actually teach you a little bit of the subtleties. Um, sort of, you know, going back to that work with the Heisenberg group, that model, um, you know, uh, I only can I can only explain the Heisenberg group as like a metric space, which makes no sense to Anton. Anton, you know, has a very big understanding of the Heisenberg group actually as like as a Lie group, and so you get these types of interactions with professors and graduate students and graduate students and undergrads all the time, where they might know one way to interact with an object, they try it, that doesn't work, then they have to actually talk to someone. Who, can, who sees it a different way. Or like if you're thinking about some object in one fashion, you can't get a model from it. You can't get the proof you want. And so now you have to go back and think about it a different way. And so it's sort of, if the professor is not learning directly from what the, under, what the graduates and undergraduates are telling them, they're at least motivated to think about it a different way. Also, whenever you visualize something, you can understand the problem better. So if you understand it, like, Lee group versus metric space of the Heisenberg group, right? When you have it in your hand, <laughs> that helps both of those understandings. And if an undergraduate is the person that's tasked with creating that visualization or that mm -hmm. model, and they go and they do that and they understand that problem well enough to create that thing, then that model exists and that visualization exists for the professor as well, the graduate student. And it just in increases their understanding of the structure. So, <clears throat> Noel, you said something very interesting because you said if the programmer cannot build the model from the mathematics, then the assumption is that there's something wrong with the mathematics. I mean, so it's... I mean, that's just, to me, that, that is a very profound statement. That's, well, it's a, sort of the assumption. And this is actually where the students, 
why they have to meet with their graduate students so often, why they have to do the 10 hours out of the lab. So if they, you know, it's, that's the assumption you get to make if the process is working exactly as, as it should. Uh, however, if the graduate student isn't talking to the undergrads and the undergrads are working 30 minutes, well, then maybe the undergrads just can't code the entire problem in 30 minutes. And so, um, you know, hopefully, if everything's working well, if the graduate student's able to talk uh, out with their graduate students, that's j usually where the problem lies. Um, this actually happened this last week where one of our graduate students came to us and were like, you know, uh, I think I finished, like, I think I can do the entire project. So I'm pretty sure I've got it down, you know. Um, and so he went, like he worked through it, he thought he, thought he had it, you know, he uh, tight coded a little bit up, and then, so he thought about how he was able to solve the problem. He took those steps out and he parceled those steps to the undergrads. And the undergrads are working through it, working through it, and they couldn't reproduce what he was doing. Um, and it turns out he was actually just really lazy when he did it the first time. Like, the, the undergrads were the ones that were right, um, you know, and it, but it was because both groups spent enough time doing it. It's because, you know, since he met with his undergraduates and since they're talented, he listened to them. I mean, we have graduate students that we handpick, you know, that don't just dismiss what the undergraduates are doing. Um, uh, I don't know where I'm going with that. I'm pretty much done, I think. <laughs> I just I have to think about it. Yeah. I, I, like, that's what we'd like. Uh, hopefully with the... If we're doing interesting research problems, the problem should lie in the mathematics, not in the, I mean, if the problem is with the technical aspect, well then we should develop new technical tools. I mean, that's, um, which is what we're always trying to do. We're always trying to develop new tools, develop new tools so the technology is not the limitation. You know, we want the interesting task to be the math. So we're always constantly developing uh, technical tools so the problem is, exa where the deficit is exactly in the math and not in what we can, what we can code, what we can print, um, that type of stuff. Thank you.